Hey everybody, this is Big Anklevich, and uh, welcome to a, an episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm here with Rish Outfield. Hey, we, we can actually see each other. This is my first ever Zoom call. <laughs> That's right, Grandpa, you have Unless finally made it into the modern age. <laughs> Uh, welcome. Welcome to 2021. Uh, it's actually not worth being welcomed to, to tell you the truth. But there was a good thing that happened in 2021. Uh, we've actually, we've got a guest with us today, and uh, we'll introduce him now. Um, uh, in 2021, he published his first novel. It is your first, right? It is my first. All right, so there he is. Jason Sanford is with us today. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the folks at home? Uh, Jason Sanford, science fiction and fantasy author. Uh, Dune Steve fans may have heard a few podcasts of my stories. I think y'all have had quite a few on over the years. Uh, two have uh, been up for Nebula Awards, and I'm finalist for the Hugo Award for, for uh, Fan Writer this year. Um, but I think what your fans may remember me for are two uh, editions of Plague Birds that y'all podcast. That's and right. I, and I, one of them, y'all did such a great job, it was a finalist for the Parsec Award. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jason's been a, uh, you know, a frequent guest, like he said. Uh, with his stories on our show, we've, we've shoot. I would say we've done like seven or eight, maybe even ten of his stories over the years. I think, so. and I've always felt he was the author who was most generous with us. We first, Jason, we first met. Well, met you through uh, Starship Sofa back in two thousand nine. You had a story called Thorns. When thorns are the tips of trees, hmm. yeah. Published in Interzone in December of 2008, and it, it wow. was May of, is amazing. <laughs> May of 2009 is when our reading of that went out. So it would have been right then after Interzone published your your story that mm -hmm. that we got that. And as far as I know, they just randomly sent us that story. But do you remember hearing that? Do, do, do you listen to podcast versions of your stories? Yes, um, a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing as an author to hear uh, a podcast of your story. But I remember when y'all podcast and uh, when uh, when Thorns were, are, are the Tips of Trees was uh, recorded. It was, uh, I believe that was my first podcast story ever. Um, and it was indeed published in uh, Inner Zone. And uh, uh I was a newer writer then, and now I'm feeling old because you're you're naming dates and all that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I do definitely remember it. Now I got to be honest, though, some podcasts I'll listen to, but usually my it's like it's hard to because I'm hearing the words I wrote and I want to rewrite it, and I'm like, oh, don't listen, don't listen. <laughs> right. No, that that makes total sense. But we had never had something, and I, I no slight to the other authors that we've done on our show, but we hadn't had something of that that we had done before we, you know, it was just, we couldn't even pay authors when we first started out and uh, wow, we just put our all into that. And we did sound effects. Do you remember big for the, uh, <laughs> because if I recall the, the, the plants communicated mm -hmm. with, with noise with, and, and so, yeah, we just went all out. We wanted to make the best impression we could. And then uh, I contacted you afterward and said, you know, did you like that? Do you have any stories that we could do on our show? And, and after that, the door was open. That, I always tell the story that you sent us three stories and said, you can pick one of these three or you can do all of them. <laughs> I remember, I remember. <laughs> and so, fresh. yeah, you were super generous. You didn't uh, give us any restrictions and you gave us those three stories. And then once those three stories were out there, <laughs> You sent us more, and over the years, it's just, I've I've always been impressed. Uh, I when when we first did that that story, I asked my friend Jeff, who's a big big sci-fi uh, reader, hey, "Have you ever heard of Jason Sanford? We're doing a story by him," and he says, "Yeah, you you mean Brandon Sanderson, don't you?" And <laughs> no, no, I didn't. But 
Uh, but yes, yeah, I, you know, I got to be honest. That's the first time I've ever, ever, ever been confused with Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> <laughs> Not no no slur on Brandon. I'm just like, hmm. I, I've never had that happen. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, here here we are, all these years later, and uh, you're yes, we did two Plague Birds stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now you have a Plague Birds novel. That is correct. Uh, yes. Can you just tell us a little bit about the the story of that and and how it's connected to what our have heard? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the first Plague Bird stories, and which was published in Inner Zone, it actually uh, was very popular. I, I uh, won their uh, readers poll for Story of the Year, and y- y- y'all also podcast the the first story. Yeah. Um, I then published a second story in Inner Zone, maybe a year, maybe a little more after that. Um, 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 what? And that story um, was also podcast. And that's the one y- y'all were finalists for the Parsec Awards for the. Uh, and y'all went all out. I mean, I listened to that one because it just it was amazing. I was like, this is like a full cast recording, um, and it, with the sound effects, it was just amazing. Um, but when I wrote the original story, um, I really loved the world and I wanted to tell more. The second story did do that, but I, I, I felt I needed to tell it. The story wasn't complete. Uh, so what I ended up doing is I'm not a fan of authors who, hey, I wrote a short story. Let me expand that short story to a novel. You know, if it worked as a short story, leave it as a short story. <laughs> so the first few chapters of the novel uh, of Plague Birds are basically or the uh, an updated version of that original story um there is a new uh short introduction you know intro section before the where the story would be but the, maybe the first three chapters three or four chapters are the original short story but i've updated it um i've rewritten it uh there's some new um new scenes and stuff like that just because um to make it work with uh later developments in the story um that second story you public uh, you podcast um, is not in the novel at all. It is a standalone story. Apex Magazine actually just is reprinting it this month, uh, but it is a standalone story. So after those first three stories, uh, first three or four chapters of Plague Birds, the novel, it's all uh, brand new, brand new stuff, telling the, continuing the story of Krista and Red Day. Uh, Krista is the main character. Red Day is the artificial intelligence. Um, I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that it's a the story set in the far future um, with a lot of genetic manipulation has uh, kind of changed humanity. And uh, you've got artificial intelligences all over the place. And the plague birds are kind of the judges, executioners and juries in the future world. They go around. There are humans that are bonded with artificial intelligence and uh, they enforce the laws of the world. So I, I wrote the story, uh, the whole novel, uh, realized I messed some things up, went back and did a complete rewrite. Uh, Apex Publications accepted it, and here's the, uh, now it's out. Got some great, uh, amazing art by Marcella Bolivar uh, for the cover art, and uh, I'm happy with it. All right. Yeah, that is good art. The uh, do, are you familiar with a, a writer named uh, Dave Wolverton or David Farland? He, he he's a local writer here where where Big and I used to live. And somebody I'm not going to say it was me. Somebody approached him and said, "I only write short stories. Uh, I'm I'm not really a novelist." And he said, "Well, you can't make a living only writing short stories. You have to find a way to be able to write novels." And I was just like, "Oh no." Uh, but but you've had this career, and as far as I know, this is your first novel. That's correct. Do you agree with that? Why did you only do short stories up to this point? And how, what was the challenge of now writing a novel, now that you're a grown man? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a grown man when I was writing the short stories, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I do love short fiction. Um, it's, a, it's a passion of mine, short stories. Um, I... Uh, I love novel length fiction too. I'm not knocking novels or anything like that. Obviously I wouldn't write a novel if I didn't think I, you know, that was the length I needed to write at to tell this story. But short fiction has a, is a passion of mine because I think it's such a distilled, pure storytelling form. Um, you know, with your novel length fiction, you can, 
have some digressions. You can go off on some tangents. You can explore all, you know, different characters in the story. With a short story, you don't have a lot of words. You've got to really keep it focused and you got to make the voice and the characters really pop. And it, it can be, uh, it's, I think it's difficult to, to pull off a great short story. And uh, I, I do love it. You know, it's just like, you know, you sit down with a, you know, a two, three thousand or five to six thousand word short story and, you know, you can spend, you know, 30 minutes reading it and that story can change your life. And I love that. I love it. So I, I mainly have written short fiction. Um, I've been pretty successful for it. Um, I don't want to put out and make any, anyone believe I make a living from my short fiction. I have a job. I work, you know, to support me and my family, you know, and, but short fiction is a passion of mine. I, I'm going to keep writing short stories. I actually have a, uh, um, one of my short stories is a cover story for the current issue of Asimov Science Fiction. Um, and uh, it's my first, I've had a, what, eight or nine stories in Asimov's over the years, but this is my first cover story. Um, I'm going to keep working on and publishing the short fiction. The Anyone who's uh, watching this, uh, if you're watching this with the video, the il Im illustration behind me is an illustration for one of my stories. And as I was telling y'all earlier, the cat does not get run over. The cat is one of the heroes of the story. <laughs> it's the story called Whistle Post of Forgotten Railroads. And um, it's a pretty emotional story about life and death and loss and all that. And I think it's only 3,000 words. And honestly, I don't think I could, if I had written that story as a novel, it would not work. So I love short fiction. But then with Plague Birds, there's things I could not do with short fiction. When I wanted to keep diving into the world of Plague Birds, I thought about making a whole sequence of short stories. But I realized that, you know what, I, I've got some larger ambitions I want to do. And there's some things you can do with novels you can't do with short fiction. And so in this case, I was like, you know what, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a novel. But you remember I said I rewrote it? Well, that's uh -huh. because I was I, I made some screw ups at, at the novel length writing that I, you know, I was trying to do some stuff with short fiction in the novel length. It didn't work. I had to go back and redo it, but it worked out. All right. So, by the way, did I ever say I ramble? I can ramble as much <laughs> as you need me to. <laughs> so now that you've written a novel, is this indicative of a changeover for you? Are you thinking of becoming a novelist? Is this something that's going to be more frequent? Or are you still you know, short stories, uh, mostly, and maybe if you come up with some idea that has to be. Um, it, I think it depends on the idea and what I want to write. Um, I've got some ideas I'm working on that will definitely be short fiction. Um, but I've also got a couple of uh, big things I want to work on, and they, they're going to definitely be novels. I'm already working on, a, um, I'm kind of cheating on my current next book. Um, it is a novel written as four separate short stories. Ah. Uh, three of them have already been published. One actually was a, a finalist for the Nebula Award, um, uh, Blood Grain Speak Through Memories. Uh, they've all been published in Beneath uh, Ceaseless Skies. Um, so three stories in a sequence, each telling the larger story, standalone stories, but they tell the larger story through different the viewpoints of, of three different characters. So I'm finishing the fourth and final story which will com basically comprise a uh, entire novel, um, but made of four separate standalone stories. So that doesn't really count because I think that's still kind of short story-ish, but you could call it a novel if you want. But I am working on some law, uh, some ideas for some actual uh, full-length novels, including I've started sketching out a sequel to Plague Birds. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's uh, something that I was wondering about. I, uh, Rish here wrote his first uh novel length well i don't know depends on what you call novel length for a long time we've considered you know we think about the hugo category where they say anything forty thousand words or up counts as a novel and i think you've written some things that are more than forty thousand words right rish but just recently you wrote something as what well. how long was it like 77 62 62 so, yeah, it's his first kind of novel, you know, what you would consider a novel length novel, not a, a real not thin a novel, novel, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's hard to, if I mean, if you're trying to sell 
to a professional publisher, it's difficult to sell a novel that's 45,000 words. Right. I will say with self-publishing and Kindle and Amazon's Kindle system and all that, I think those parameters are changing. But uh, yeah, you know, traditionally you're talking 70, 75,000 at a minimum for what most publishers would want to publish as a novel. But that said, it's again, changing quickly. Yeah, that's uh, something that I've heard a lot of, you know, been to a few different writers conferences and things like that. And there's people that work full time as uh, self-published authors and they will, you know, they were they would talk about putting out a novel like a, every month, you know, <laughs> I have views. I have views on that, but I'll be yeah. <laughs> basically they were just like, you know, we can't turn off the spigot. Your fans will go away. So you know, they would just churn stuff out and they would have, you know, a four, it was short. Obviously, it'd be like a 40,000 uh, word novel, not a huge, you know, you can not, not one of those, uh, you know, fantasy tomes, the ones that are like this big. Not a Brandon Sanderson. Right, exactly. Not like the Way of Kings where, you know. By the way, just, can I just add a note? You know, Brandon Sanderson is like a really nice guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen him a few times. It's amazing how he interacts with his fans. And uh, just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> so another reason why we would confuse you with him. There you go. Oh. <laughs> the second story that we did of, of Plague Birds, I think, was called The Ever Dreaming. The Ever. What, what is it? Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plagues, oh, I think. Verdict yeah. of Plagues. Holy cow. Uh, but but that's the one that's not incorporated into your novel, Jason. Do, that is is there, does that still take place somewhere in the future? And do you have to keep that in the back of your mind that I don't want to contradict that sometime we're going to get to that? No, it's, it's a standalone story. And it's it's in the canon. It's in the Plague Birds canon for <laughs> sure, because uh, um, I actually um, it takes place about a third of the way through the novel. It's just not included in the novel. But oh, okay. I got one sentence in there that references it. You know, just I was like, anybody reads a story, they read this. Oh, OK. Yeah. So it is there. It's just not shown as part of the novel. It's kind of it's a standalone story. Um, I'd like to I was haven't mentioned this to my publisher yet, but I was hoping to they published it in Apex magazine this month, uh, reprinted it. And I was hoping that, you know, hey, maybe y'all should publish it as a standalone book if Plague Birds does well, you know, kind of, the, you know, like I said, but it, it is definitely part of the story. and. Uh, it's just, you know, honestly, when I was initially writing the story, I thought I would include, I mean, the novel, I thought I would include it, but I realized it was just a standalone. It was like, a, in this, what, a, I think right under 10,000 words. So it is a longer story, but yeah, it's, it would just function as a standalone story of the two main characters. But I yeah. think it holds up well. If I remember right, we had to make it two episodes because it was long enough. <laughs> yeah, it was a long one, but I, I do love it. I, I, kind of went through to see if I needed to clean it up and I think it still holds up. I'm pleased with it. My, my publisher and editor liked it, so he wouldn't have reprinted it. So. Right. Yeah. If nothing else, you know, 10 years from now, when you, when you do the anniversary edition, you could include it in the back or something like that. <laughs> I'd love it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I loved, uh, I loved the podcast y'all have done over the years for my stories. I mean, uh, it, like I said, sometimes it's hard for me to listen to podcasts usually of my works just because, uh, like I said, it kind of resonates since I wrote the words. It's hard to hear the words being read to me um, or narrated. And and it, but your podcasts, especially those, I mean, it's just like it was like sitting down in front of a, you know, TV show, but all all audio and just listening, you know, and I it's a it's, it's kind of a which is still disturbing, you know, because you, you know, I'm like, wow, did I write that? I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, but I've loved what y'all have done and, and I'm glad your, your podcast magazine's done so well. Yeah. Well, thanks. We've loved to have you. I'll have to admit it's, it's been a pleasure for in, in each case, each time that uh, your name comes up again, I think, uh, a, you're one of the fans' favorites. You know, they look forward to your stories when they would come up. And you were one of our favorites. We looked forward to doing your stories when they would come up because it was, it was always, you know, that's the one thing that you um, always did is your worlds are so generally very different 
than the real world. You know what I mean? Like a lot of stories are just set in the real world in the real world with, you know, a slight change or something like that, you know, or there's a a future that's, you know, easy to imagine, if you know what I mean. Yours tend to uh, be so much more different that it's, you know, like when I say easy to imagine, yours are a little, I guess, a little harder to imagine. I assume they must take so much more work on your part, you know, so much more Mm pre-planning to come up with all the background uh, stuff that uh, you you put into the worlds because, you know, it's not really a recognizable thing for uh, for us. So, you know, it's such a it's such a really interesting and fun, uh, you know, narration and pr- production to do oh, cool. uh, to make that stuff work. And some of the things that we have to come up with, you know, how do you do something like this in audio so that it portrays what's happening uh, can be, <laughs> can be a challenge. Some of the audio effects you've done, um, see what, um, there was one where you made, I, I forgot how you did the voice or something, but it was just like, wow. You know, and it was like, y'all took so far beyond what I wrote. I loved it. I, and I can't remember which story it is now, but it just uh-huh. it like sent chills up my spine. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has been a while, sadly. It's a little bit like translating something into another language where we have to interpret the meaning, the meaning, and it might not be exactly the way you intended it. Is there an audio version of your novel, Plague Birds? Uh, no, no, there is not. No. Um, but it's possible they, you know, we may release one, but it hasn't. Um, there is an option for the publisher to do one, but it, at this point, there's not. But in professional circles, you wouldn't have anything to do with that, right? They would go off and and pick a narrator and mm-hmm. and produce it outside of yours. And so even if you're to say, oh, no, that's not the way that I saw it in my head, you have no control over that. Am I right? Uh, actually, I, I do. Um I do have some control, mainly mainly because I went with a small press for uh, uh, Plague Birds. Um, I don't think I would have as much control if I went with the larger press uh, public publisher had published it. Um, but you know, with Apex Books, they're not going to, you know, hey, we're going to do this. Congratulations, we're going to run you over now. If um, if I had issues, um, uh, they would definitely uh, raise the uh, do deal with it. In fact. Okay, side note, the illustration for my story here, uh, Whistle Post of uh, Forgotten Railroads, was in the uh, last, came out a year ago in Fireside Quarterly. I don't know if y'all heard what happened. This was actually, this is the last print edition of Fireside Magazine. They're now, they're still publishing, they're online. So what happened is last year, um, Maurice Broadus edited, guest edited this issue. He picked my story and a bunch of others. Uh, including a story, uh, he picked an essay, let's see, where, where is it here, um, by Regina Bradley. And let me just, um, I'll read you the first issue and then tell you what happened, the first sentence and tell you what happened. So the essay is a personal essay written by Regina Bradley that starts off that says, I am a Southern Black woman who stands in the long shadow of the civil rights movement. She is speaking from her personal experience. And so the magazine, um, do, releases audio versions of all the stories that they publish. So they released an audio version of that essay uh, narrated by a white man who decided to do a, a fake black Southern accents mixed with a Jamaican accent. It was horrid. Uh, it was, it got me national media attention. Uh, and basically even the publisher admitted, admitted it was basically audio black faced. You know, it was, I mean, the author, Regina Bradley, was outraged, and rightly so. Um, They had not consulted with Regina. They had not consulted with, uh, or with Dr. Bradley, with or with Maurice Broadus about that. Publisher just said, hey, you go do this, narrate it. And then, yeah, so that, so you don't, you don't want something like that to happen. You know what I mean? Right. It unfortunately caused a good bit of fallout on that, and uh, the magazine's still around, and they've made some changes. I guess that's say how how it all came out yeah that is yeah, i wouldn't so yes i all that means is yes i would want to have some input in who is narrating my stories and i think most authors would because you don't want you know it's part of your vision you know but 
I'm usually pretty laid back on stuff. Y'all done a great job, so I've got no issues. But, you know, for something like a novel, you know, I just at least want to know who's narrating it. I always knew y'all were narrating it, and I'm cool with that. But you wouldn't want your publisher just out of nowhere saying, we're doing this, and you don't know what we're doing until... Um, anyway, I'm rambling. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. It's definitely something. I mean, it's your your book. It's your career. You know, you don't want to wind up being the focus of media attention for something like that right. <laughs> instead you want the media attention because wow this is a great book uh kind of media attention um so yeah it's important to, to guard that kind of stuff for sure it's hard to narrate story. it's hard to narrate though y'all you know a narration is a fine art and creating a audio version of a story is a fine art um you know, so if Apex said we are going to go ahead with the audio, do you want to narrate it? Would you decline? Oh, I, abs- I would decline, and so fast you would. <laughs> I mean, you, it'd be like a lightning bolt. I would decline so fast. Um, I've narrated two of my stories before. Um, I think one was from Starship Sofa. I don't, I don't remember the second one. I I don't remember where it was. After I did the first one, I said, I'm never doing that again. Then I got talked into it and I did it again. I said, <laughs> why did I do that again? I'm not a narrator. I don't like to narrate and it's hard to, for me to do it. And I also narrated uh, someone else's uh, story for Starship Sofa or for their, uh, I'm sorry, for their horror pod- podcast. And I said, I'm never doing this again. Anyway, but I narrated the story. I agreed to do it. And I remember Tony said, Jason, you have a Southern accent. You would be wonderful. <laughs> You know, the character was supposed to have a Southern, be Southern and all that. I said, fine, I'll do it. I was young and naive. And then I I, I agreed with it before I read the story. And then I read the story and I realized, oh, crap, this story has sing. I have to sing in parts of it. <laughs> and that was like a special hell. <laughs> so, no, never again. I'm never narrating again. I'm a writer. I don't narrate. I can ramble on a podcast or an interview, but I'm not I'm not going to narrate. Your book came out a couple of weeks ago now, right? It's been two weeks, I think. I think two weeks, yes. Yeah. And uh, how's, how has that been? What has the experience been like? It's been stressful, mainly because I, it's a busy time in my life right now uh, outside the book. But it's just, I've been really, I uh, haven't been, haven't written anything in two weeks because I've been so busy with all the, you know, stuff doing to promote the book, but also uh, just general life stuff. Everything is like, you know, I always thought I'd be able to enjoy my the release of my book. And and life said, you know, we're going to put everything, a whole year's worth of crap in three weeks and dump it on you. Enjoy. <laughs> but it's been thrilling to see the book come out, though. That's a special. I've always wanted to, to publish and write a novel. Um, it's my first one. And then have it have, have Apex do such an amazing job. Uh, the cover art alone, I'm like just wants me i just want to move to tears and cry over how great it came out well hey jason tell us how that ha- that happens do you have any control over the cover art actually yes i uh, apex um apex uh jason sizemore do you know jason he's the publisher and editor of uh apex he also edits and publishes the magazine apex magazine so the um um you know, obviously, as a publisher, they hire and and work with the uh, with the artist. So, hey, Jason contacted me, and said, "Hey, you familiar with Marcella uh, Bolivar, uh, the artist?" And I was like, "Oh, I love her art." And he's like, "Well, we want we'd like her to do the art." And I was like, "Hell yeah! Oh, hell yeah!" Um, so then, uh, Marcella, we kind of went back and forth. Marcella wants some, I you know, she needs to know what kind of stuff are we looking for. Give me some ideas. Um, even though there's description of uh, on the cover, I'll, I'll hold it up for anybody who's watching. This is Krista, uh, the main character on the cover. Um, and it is cut uh, from a scene in the novel, although it's it, it, a lot of artistic license, which I absolutely wanted Marcella to take. But she wanted um, information on what the character looks like, all that kind of stuff. Um, Jason Sizemore and I kind of, uh, bound, and, and others uh, at Apex bounced around different scenes, maybe some ideas. And we kind of just threw all that together and sent it to Marcella. Um, She worked up based on our our feedback and everything, uh, three three draft illustrations. And I got to be honest, all three of them were amazing. Um, The uh, any one of them 
Um, and, and when I'm saying draft illustrations, it's not like it used to be where, you know, you may have gotten a charcoal sketch. Uh, you know, we're talking a, you know, a, an illustration created, you know, because a lot of the art is created digitally. Right. Um, an illustration that, you know, you could use as a finished illustration for a book. I was, you know, it was like, wow. Um, and uh, then we basically, uh, Jason and other staff, everybody was like, okay, which one do we like best? And uh, this one was the one I was like, this one, this one, you know, sent a few feedbacks to Marcella and so to other staff. We tweaked and went with this one. And it turns out this was the, um, I told you we'd sent Marcella some ideas for what the art could be. Um, she had created those, but this one that she created was kind of her inspiration and it was her favorite, but she didn't tell us. She didn't want to bias it. You know what I mean? So, but we were all like, we want this one. And she was like, oh, great. That's the one I kind of decided to do something risky and went out on a limb with, and it's my favorite. And we were like, we'd love it, you know? So, so yes, I was, that was my rambling way of saying, yes, I got to be very involved. <laughs> Again, that's something uh, that I know a large publisher may, would not let me be that, being that involved in. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. Well, for example, your Asimov's cover, you don't have any say in that, I would assume. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, uh, Sheila Williams is the editor of Asimov's, and um, I did not know she had picked my story for an illustration until um, it, the illustration was done. She sent it to me to look at, and I was like, oh, this is wow, I love it. And I do, I do, I love it too, but I mean, I didn't see it until it was done. But it, fortunately, it, it came out <laughs> amazing because she picked a great artist. But I don't know the process that Asimov's has. Uh, you know, it's it's different for, and a magazine also has a different time scale. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're having to release, uh, they're bi monthly. So they're having to release an issue every, you know, two months or six times a year. So they've got a, they've got some different uh, time pressures than uh, a small press like Apex, which is working towards a book that is going to be on the shelves for a long time, but it, they're not releasing it every month or two. I see. I'm I'm at a much lower level of fame, of success than you are, Jason. So the the things that you're going through are fascinating to me. From inception of Plague Birds, the novel, to publishing, which was the end of September. Mm -hmm. How long a stretch of time was this? Okay, so I um, let's see. You seem to have a better memory than me. I think the original story came out, the original Plague Bird story came out in 2010. I want to say, I could be wrong. It could have been, but I want to say sometime in 2010 in, in Interzone. The second story came out a year or two after that, somewhere in there. I'm not, again, off the top of my head, I'm not remembering the exact dates. Um, I didn't start working on the novel until maybe 2014. So, I'm again, I'm not writing uh, the no this novel uh, by itself. I'm work also working on a number of short stories at the same time. I'm publishing a good bit of short fiction. So I probably I worked on the novel for a year or so, a year and a half or so, finished it up. And that's again, that's when I discovered, you know what? Congratulations, Jason. You've got a major rewrite ahead of you and not just a cleanup rewrite. I had to do, you know, make major plot changes and some other stuff because, again, it was my first novel. I screwed the pooch on some stuff. And I said, you know, but the thing was, I was deeply invested in the story and I want, I knew how to make it work. I just knew it was going to take a lot more time. I uh, I did put it aside for a bit because it is dejecting when you realize you have to do that major of a rewrite. <laughs> um, but I also, um, I sent it out to, you know, I did the rewrite, um, got it cleaned up. I did send it out to some publishers and editors and uh, agents. Um, Plague Birds, as y'all know, is kind of, even though it's science fiction, it, it reads somewhat like a, a dark fantasy, okay? So there's some blurring of the genres. It is science fiction, um, but it, it reads like the fantasy. So I got uh, some agents were like, man, this is so, we love this, so weird, but I don't know how to market it, so we have to pass, which was frustrating as hell. Um, all of that. So after that reaction, I said, you know what, I'm going to, I did a final, uh, third rewrite just to clean up some, uh, not as in depth. It was just kind of a, you know, if I'm going to go through it again, that was in 2019, early 2020, I submitted it to, uh, Apex 
March, April 2020, somewhere in there, right before the pandemic kind of went bluey. And they accepted it in December 2020. Um, worked, you know, we have copy edits and all that, working on the artwork and, you know, and then it came out in September of this year. So it was accepted last December, essentially. And then ever since then, it's been in pr production. A fairly long process. It was. And I mean, part of it, now I got to be honest, I, I am, my writing style is not everyone else's. You know, I write, uh, I can, I write, tend to write rather slowly. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, I know authors who can crank out a novel a month. Um, I have views on that. Like I said earlier, I think that kind of burns you out. And eventually it's going to make your brain explode or turn to mush. Or, and you're going to have to take a big, long break from your fiction writing because you just can't get <laughs> that up. But I understand why they do it, because, you know, hey, like they said, you know, you can crank that many books out. You, you know, keep your uh, fans happy and they're coming back for you. I don't write like that. Um, I'm a lot slower, um, but it's, it's, it works for me. So no, I'm not going to complain. Uh, let me go back to something big said a minute ago, where he was talking about the worlds that you, you create, you put in a ton of thought, if not effort into what this future will be like. Yeah. And then are you ever tempted to just stay in that future, in that world and say, Oh, I could write three or four more stories set in this one. So I don't have to come up with a new locale. I am tempted and I, I am going to write more stories. Uh, it, it, part of it, though, is um, I got I have more stories I want to tell. I mean, I, uh, I love uh, the characters of Krista and Red Day. Um, you know, I love I'm trying not to give spoilers, but I love their relationship between the two of them is very unique. And, you know, it can and it, you can touch on all the emotions when they're by themselves, if you know what I mean. You know, you can't do that. You know, usually if you got one character by themselves in the story, ooh, you know, you can't really get that repartee going back and forth. We can with Krista and Red Day. No spoilers, but read it if you want to find out what I'm talking about. And, you know, it's they're stuck together and I love it. And and but also uh, there's things I explore in the, the novel that are, are, are of great interest to me. I mean, I'm talking about issues. I mean. I write my fiction. I mean, I'm talking about stuff I see in the world around me. I mean, um, I, I kind of have a weird outlook on life. So I see the world in a unique way. And I kind of, and that goes right into my fiction. And this is, I mean, the novel, yes, it's set in the far future, but it means it's also about the world today, I think, in many ways. And I definitely got more I want to say. And while the I, the novel is a standalone novel, I, 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 I that's another one of my pet peeves is when you read a book and oh crap cliffhanger this is the first book in a series. Wait, I'm gonna have to wait five years for book two. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, when you're reading a book by George R. R. Martin and you're like, oh no. <laughs> so um, the book does have a good. I mean, it is a self-contained story. It wraps up. Um, but I did leave some things so that uh, for a second book and for, you know, so um, there are bigger issues I want to, uh, which I do want to explore. And um, so far, I haven't heard from anyone saying I didn't tie things up. I mean, a few reviewers are like, hey, this is great. And he also left a few things. He wrapped things up, but I could see he could write a second, another more books. And I, I do intend to. And I I don't know how many I'm going to write. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm i Definitely have a, a the idea of the story for the second book, and um, I will go from there. You know what I mean? I don't want to overpromise. <laughs> right. See if uh, something else pops up in your brain as you're doing the, uh, the the next book, and maybe there'll be a third and so forth. But I do love this world. I got to be honest. Most of my stories are standalone, and I, when I'm done with it. Um, it's like it's cleared from my mind and I don't ever think about the story again. And I got to be honest, it's kind of embarrassing. I, I never admitted this, but um, once I a story is cleared from my mind, I sometimes have trouble even remembering what the title is, just how my <laughs> mind works. Well, it probably has a lot to do with the kind of titles that you come up with. It's your <laughs> own thought, Jason. <laughs> Make a shorter title. <laughs> so I was at a convention once and uh, a publisher came up to me. And he was working on a big anthology and he's like, man, I love this story of yours. I'm, I may include it. And he ended up including it. 
And I was thrilled. But he's talking to me like, I just love this story. What was the title? And I was like going, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, I was like, as I'm, I take a big swig of my drinks. Oh, I've been drinking. I think I've been drinking. Hold on. And then luckily, one of my friends came up, talked to him, say, I turned around, pulled up my phone. Tap, 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 tap. Oh, that's it. OK. Oh, you mean this story? I had totally, totally forgotten this title of my own story, even though I knew what story he was talking about. But like I said, it was it's not it's just when I cl- finish a story and I feel it's totally wrapped up, I purge it. You right. know what I mean? It is purged. Right. But the good news is Plague Birds has not been purged because I, I there's a lot more I want to tell in that world, more stories I want to tell. So it feels different with this one. That's why I know I'm going to write more. Yeah, it could be worse. Uh, Rish has a tendency to be looking through his computer and find a file and be like, what is this? And he'll open it up and it'll be a story that he wrote and he doesn't remember even writing it. Doesn't seem familiar to him at all. So, you know, at least you know that you wrote the story. You just can't remember the title. Well, that's not a bad thing. I mean, I, I got to be honest, Rish, I've been there too. I've, I've found, oh, I forgot I wrote that. Um, but when you do that, that's actually part of my writing style. When I come back to it, I put stories aside. So when I was saying, you know, I, I started writing Plague Birds in 2014. Yeah, I wrote it and then I put it aside, come back to it, because that lets me come back to it with clean eyes, with, you know, from a fresh uh, perspective. So when I find a story I worked on a long time ago, I usually didn't finish it because there was an issue I couldn't overcome at that time. Um, I am what they call a discovery writer. Or if you want to call me a pantser, I, I'm, I don't use that term, but discovery writer for my short fiction. So I don't plot my short fiction out. Um, and I'll come back to a story after six months or a few months or even a year away. And uh, I'll be like, oh, I know how to make this work now as I'm going through it. And it works out. And there, so there's great. If you can come back to a story and you've forgotten about it, I think that really helps you improve it. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, the, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, please. I was, no, I was going to say, where can people get Plague Birds, the novel? Uh, uh, is there a place that you prefer that they get it? Uh, they can order directly from Apex Books. Obviously, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, bookshop.org, I believe it is. You know, uh, uh, all the places. You can order it from almost any bookstore um, it is a small press, so I don't know how many, I can't tell you if it's in your local bookstore or not, uh, but all the all the big players. And But if you want to order directly from Apex, that's always a good thing. I will point out right now um, is a rough time for small presses uh, because paper prices have increased dramatically. Um, I think you know, small press is facing a 10 or 11 percent increase of for publishing books just on the paper price alone. And then there's an increased cost of shipping everything right now. Uh, mailing costs are gone up. But that said, that those issues are also hitting your local bookstores. So order it from your local bookstore. You know, I've, I have no problem with that. Or, you know, order it from uh, Apex, order it from, and honestly, if you want to order it from Kindle, uh, Amazon, you want it on your Kindle, you go for it because you know what, I'd rather you read it than not. <laughs> No, oh, so in Amazon, I mean, they're a fact of life. You got to deal with it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I was pretty excited. I have to admit, uh, when your Facebook post came up uh, talking about uh, plague birds coming out, and as soon as I saw it, I thought I got to get uh, you know, I, I got to forward this along to anybody that I know that might be uh, willing to to pick this up. I don't know how many sales we may have gotten for you. I know at least. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> where are we at? Here we go. I got my copy. So, <laughs> well, and thank you very much. <laughs> I pre ordered it. So, if you can tell, it's got the. Oh, it's got that. Nice. The sign book. With, the, oh, with the sign. Let me see. Put it over the mic so you can see. This, this oh, that's great. That's, there. great. that's great. So, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Well, thank and, you. I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> hopefully, uh, several other people, uh, you know, got theirs uh, by way of that as well. But if not, um, you know, hopefully after seeing this, they'll be interested again. Hopefully they remember uh, the stories that we've done in the past from yours and will, will you know, remember just how good 
uh, they can be. And, and I think if people liked your podcast of the of both stories, uh, they're going to love the novel because, like I said, it um, it goes into some strange, strange places. I'll be <laughs> honest; it's, it can it gets weird, but. You know, I had a I had a lot of fun writing the stories out. You know, the story out because, like I said, I do love the characters of Red Day and Krista, and uh, it's kind of it was exciting to be able to take them on a, a much more longer journey. Yep, and I'm excited. I haven't gotten around to reading it yet, unfortunately. You know, I'm slow at that. I have to admit. I appreciate that. I don't know if you yeah, can tell, but I got a lot of books back there. <laughs> um, when the cover came out, um, I, I thought I, I thought I'd tell y'all I saw this. Um, a uh, big U- YouTuber who's a, a fantasy, uh, he, he, the, a booktuber, uh, was talking about the cover and everything. And and in the comments, someone said, I got so excited when I you mentioned this on your you, on this uh, YouTube, because I, I remember the original stories from from Dune Steve. Oh, wow. I was like, wow, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, that always surprises me when I when I hear tell of uh, our show from some somebody once said that like they were on vacation. I want to say it was at the Eiffel Tower somewhere like that, and they saw somebody wearing a Dune Steef shirt, and cool. he said, "Oh, Dune Steef, give him the thumbs up." The guy gave him, and I just thought that can't you know that the odds of two Dune Steef fans coming within contact of each other is longer than winning the lottery. That can't be possible. <laughs> I think but, y'all have a lot more fans than you realize. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll we'll give you the rest of your Sunday afternoon. We'll let you go. It's been a great to talk with you and, and uh, hear the stories. And, you know, we wish you the best of luck with uh, Plague Birds and with the further novels and short stories down the road. Can't wait to see your name come up again in my uh, Facebook feed tell me that there's another thing that I can, uh, I can pre-order. Great. I appreciate the support. And like I said, thank you. I, uh, uh, honestly, I think this novel without a uh, Dune Steve would not be where it is today. And I, I'm certain of that. So thank you. Wow. Well, thanks. That's, that's, um, that's great to hear that. That really makes me feel good. I have to admit. Nothing in Big's life makes him feel good. So oh. <laughs> you're living air, Jason. Oh, uh, well, hey, y'all, I'm like I said, anytime. Y'all, I appreciate all y'all have done and, and uh, keep doing it. Keep Just keep going, you know. I hope to, hope to meet y'all in person one day when this world settles down, so to speak. Right, right. All right. Well, thanks a lot for, for, uh, for being here with us. And I uh, guess we'll see you around. Thanks, Take everybody, care. watching and listening, too. We'll see you uh, next time. Sorry for picking my nose. It just, I forgot you were there.